With all the jobs, jabs and other japes happening now that lockdown is easing up, I haven't been able to spend as much time as I'd like with the collection chamber. On the plus side, there's a bumper edition of this month's roundup, including all the old gems I've uncovered these past two months. So without further ado, let's begin. We begin with a collection of movie licenses based on Total Recall. Not long ago I found my box Atari ST copy, so I thought I'd play it again, for the first time in decades. I remember very clearly that my younger self couldn't quite get past the first enemy, let alone the first stage, but perhaps now I could get further. And you know what, I could, and it's not a bad take on the license either, even though it won't exactly wow anyone. There's still far too many cheap deaths and enemies that spawn far too frequently, but once you get past the first level, the game passes by at quite the brisk pace. Back then, in 1990, there were four distinct games in total. This one also came out for the Amiga, which offers smoother scrolling that surprisingly adds to the difficulty. The Amstrad CPC and ZX Spectrum games follow the same template, a 2D platforming stage followed by a car-based horizontal shooter. This time the ZX Spectrum is near unplayable, even if you could get used to the vomit of colours on display. By comparison, the Amstrad CPC was miles ahead, looking very nice considering the age and limited hardware. As for the gameplay, well... The first level puts off all but the most masochistic of players. There are switches that turn off and on coloured blocks which need to be cleverly manipulated to see the end of the level, but are a pain in the ass to find, let alone get there. The enemies may be easy enough to shoot through, but it was the controls that really angered me. There's a good chance every missed platform will lead to an insta-death fire pit, and you'll miss those jumps often. You'll need to be at a specific point to clear the gap and the sluggish and imprecise joystick controls don't really help. It's unforgiving, but funnily enough, the fire pits in later levels don't kill you in one hit, instead only draining your health bar a little. If I had this as a kid, there'd be no way I'd even get to that point. The Commodore 64 game fares a lot better, even if the jumping arc remains a bloody pain. You still have a punishing first level that is almost designed to trick you into dying, but there is a logic to how everything is played out. The jumps are specific and predictable once you get used to the bounce back. Like the others, the levels are interspersed with a car base section. This time it's a top down drive rather than a shoot 'em up, and it kinda looks like an early Grand Theft Auto prototype. However, when you play it, it's ridiculously difficult, with an inertia on your vehicle that's more like a bumper car on ice. The aim is to pick up a speed power up, and then jump over a raised bridge without meeting those pesky bad guys. They are shown flashing on the map, which does help, but the speed boost isn't enough to see you sail over that gap until you really know what you're doing. It will require trial, error, joystick dexterity, and map memorization to get there, and I didn't really have the patience to keep going. But all that is nothing when compared to the NES version. The graphics are appallingly awful, with Arnold Schwarzenegger's Quaid looking like a derpy lug than an undercover spy with a bodybuilding side hustle. Many enemies are laughably half your size, peeking around walls to drag you into the side alley for some fisticuffs. The first level is not too difficult in comparison to the others, but still annoying enough to scare off many disappointed children that Christmas. I will give it this, it does follow the plot of the movie more accurately than the others, but that's the best I can say about it. to another movie license, The Beverly Hillbillies. Who would have thought a game would be made out of this forgotten comedy from the early 90s? Well, Capstone did, and if you know anything about their reputation, that name sends a shudder down your spine. This buggy excuse for a point and click adventure does everything it can to frustrate and disappoint you. When simple pathfinding across an empty room is an issue, you know there's a problem. The game begins on the Clampit Ranch, and you play as Jed, the patriarch of the family, who's hunting a rabbit for dinner. You have to get this rabbit to a specific spot, so when you shoot it, a black geezer will erupt and progress the plot. If you've seen the old black and white sitcom, this is all explained in the opening song. So they loaded up the truck and they moved to Beverly. 
Hills, that is. The Beverly Hillbillies. Confusingly placed screens are filled with red herrings, and characters that aim to offer help give none anyway. How you manipulate your inventory is also a little unintuitive. For example, you use a gun on Jed so he'll hold it, and then you use a gun on him too in order to shoot it. Normally you would combine the bullet with the gun or use the gun on the target, so this way of doing things is completely counterintuitive to every other adventure game out there. It might be a tiny bit more tolerable later on in the game, but like every other capstone adventure, this one's best avoided. For a better take on the genre, try Hollywood Monsters instead. Made by the same people behind the Runaway series, this 1997 Spanish language game never came to the US or the UK, and so an English version never existed. Over a decade later we did get its sequel named The Next Big Thing, but us English speakers have to rely on a fan translation to play the original. ¿Creó usted mismo el Nessie Boom? No! Fue mi tatarabuelo, John McDandy! The game reimagines Hollywood A-listers as classic monsters, from the mummy to Dracula to King Kong. You'll meet them all. But you begin the game as Sue Bergman, Sue Bergman. a journalist for the Quill newspaper. She is covering the hedonistic after-party to a Hollywood awards show, where classic monsters are honoured for their work. In her struggle to get some juicy gossip, she instead unwittingly stumbles on a nefarious plot that leads to her disappearance, and that of the talk of the town, Frankenstein. After this, she gets to play as Sue's colleague, Ron Ashman, Ron Ashman, who aims to be as sarcastic as he can on his mission to find his friend and colleague. It plays very much like a LucasArts game from the era, with no fear of death or dead ends and a light-hearted sense of humour that may have been a tad dulled in translation. Some lines do come across as dry and perfunctory, especially when some tidbits you might understand from the energetic speech appear much more flamboyant. An obvious example of this is Homer, the dancing skeleton. In its original language, he's called humorous, like the bone. Another is when the mummy speaks an incantation to open the vault in his Egyptian pyramid. His dialogue just describes what he's doing, while the phrase abracadabra can easily be heard by the voice actor. Mete todo en una cámara de abracadabra. Que solo tu bastón haga que se abra. Perhaps there was a joke in there that only Spanish speakers would get but I was left a little confused by the translation decision. For the most part, however, the text is top-notch, bordering on professional, and I can't be more grateful that it exists at all. If you've enjoyed any of the studio's other games, Hollywood Monsters is a must-play. It doesn't disappoint. Oh, no puedes matar. Hombre. Ahí está Igor, el viejo sirviente del Dr. Frankenstein. Los años no pasan por él. Y no perdonan. If you want a different take on a classic movie monster, why not try Nosferatu? This cinematic platformer for the Super Nintendo is a faster paced attempt at the Prince of Persia formula, and one that really shows the graphical capabilities of the 16-bit console. It's a truly Japanese take on the legally distinct story of Dracula, where werewolves, zombies and some of Frankenstein's creatures are added to the story. Beyond the thoughtful platforming and deadly traps you'd expect to find in such a game, there is a refreshingly arcadey vibe to the combat, which plays more like a beat-em-up than anything else. You have a huge variety of moves to perform, and each are well animated and satisfying when you pull them off. And they're all executed with only two buttons, one to jump and another to attack. While it's more nuanced and predictable than other cinematic platformers, which can often feel like a game of chance more than skill, the limited buttons does mean you'll need dexterous thumbs to successfully pull everything off. This is more pronounced in common platforming manoeuvres, which also use the same system. If you want to slide under a gap, double tap to run, then press back and attack at the same time. It's not impossible, but when time and space are not on your side, the fumble of buttons becomes immensely inconvenient, especially with such an unusual method of control. Nosferatu isn't quite the best cinematic platformer of its time out there, but it's close. Take away the timer in the levels, add more emphasis on exploration in each environment, and it could easily sit eye to eye with the Persian Prince or Mystical Murrican. As it is, it will more than satiate those who have seen all the others have to offer, so I'd highly recommend it. A 
Another overlooked cinematic platform is Bermuda Syndrome. In this game, you play as a downed fighter pilot in World War II, who just so happens to crash onto a lush, dinosaur-filled island. You then save a half-naked human sacrifice, her royal father, and make some dinosaurs extinct for the second time. The story and setting reminded me a lot of King Kong, or other classic serials from the 30s and 40s, in its simple yet exciting setup and breezy charm. Unlike many of the cinematic platformers I've been drawn to lately, the gameplay loop is a little different. There's still the occasional maze of platformers to cross and traps to avoid, much like Prince of Persia or Another World, but these tend to be limited to their own specific area. These are the closest the game has to levels, and are accessed by placing a crystal in the stone palm of a raptor statue. It will then zap you to an underground cave system, the most visually unappealing area in an otherwise good looking game, and to get out the other side you have to find the next statue to continue. I can imagine that these sections were probably added to puff out the length of the game, but this isn't necessarily a bad way to do so, they are certainly different to the rest of the game, and entertaining in their own right. Outside of these areas is where the game really shines. Each screen will likely have a puzzle to solve before you can continue, and they tend to focus on removing or avoiding obstacles that block your way. Failure does tend to mean instant death, however, how you solve them often reminds me of an adventure game. There are even mechanics that use verb icons and an inventory. Press tab and a window of icons will pop up. From here you can select an item to hold in your hand, such as a knife or crystal, or you can select one of the three icons, a hand, a mouth, and Natalia, who is the sacrificial princess I talked about earlier. The hand stands for interact, and will mostly be used to pick things up. The mouth is talk, and you do so to whoever's in front of you. Though if Natalia is with you, she has her own dedicated symbol, which often leads to awkward flirting. All work and no play makes Jack a very dull boy indeed. Come here. You won't get anything as complex as a full adventure game here, but combined with your traditional cinematic tropes it makes for quite the engrossing experience. Definitely a hidden gem. This stepping disc reminds you of your recent narrow escape from the antimatter explosion. We return to Ringworld for a more traditional adventure in, well, Return to Ringworld. Despite a decent enough premise and some imaginative locations, the non-interactive nature of the first game made me hope the passive interactive scale would be more balanced for the sequel. It sounds like Tsunami Media took our criticisms to heart in our Return to Ringworld, as there is a lot more game here. This time, however, the scale is tipped too far to the other side. The overarching plot is pretty basic stuff, the kind of story you'd find in a cheap Star Wars knockoff. If anything is going to keep you playing, it would be the smaller plot lines that take place in the remote villages found on the ring's surface. As before, the locations are inviting and steeped in lore that provides a good juxtaposition with the futuristic sci-fi stuff surrounding them. One of the folk's finest helium balloon packs. This time you'll be spending a lot more time within them, because not only are they stuffed with the same long scenes of dialogue as before, but also a mass load of screens to explore. This is Tsunami's attempt at adding gameplay, and it's not entirely successful. There are more puzzles this time round, and a lot of them are actually fun to solve, but there are also mazes. Large, boring mazes. Plural. Your first encounter with one will be on a service platform on the outside of the ring, where a massive area can be explored. Here you'll traipse the vast expanse, screen by screen, until you find an unnecessarily large number of items, nine in total. Some are seemingly placed in a random spot, devoid of any scenery, while others require quick manipulation of the environment. If you cut out the superfluous dead and empty screens, I estimate about 90% in this instance, and it would be far more bearable. Even the more traditional maze of service corridors that you'll eventually come across is much larger than it needs to be. This area contains some vampires to vanquish, and with a total of 18 to find, the whole sequence took me more than 15 minutes to finish. That's 15 minutes of doing nothing else, 
It was so tedious that I had to give up playing for a while just to restart my dulled brain. The more traditional puzzles do fare much better and actually improve on its predecessor. A moment requiring an inventive use of a gas torch and a glass dome harks back at my year 7 science classes, while the earlier use of a super powerful electromagnet is just as inspired. Some of them are actually very entertaining to solve, proving that there is a lot of talent involved behind the scenes. I just wish there was a lot more opportunities to show them off. You can play as all three members of your crew, each playing slightly differently. Quinn is your go-to protagonist, resourceful and good in scrapes. Seeker is strong with a violent streak. And Miranda spends most of her time in a completely different location. This feels like a response to the first game, where other characters will often complete now. tasks for you. Now, their character may complete that task, but you are still playing the game, no matter how asinine that task may be. When either game is good, they stand up as some of the best in the genre, or at least close to it. However, each game has just enough flaws that I find it hard to recommend them to anyone other than the most patient of adventure gamers out there. DEFCON 5, a mid-90s first-person shooter from Millennium Interactive, does more than most to distinguish itself from being just another Doom clone. In fact, it's more like a strategic defence game with some neat ideas that, in my opinion, don't entirely come together. You are an engineer sent to do some tests on a decommissioned starbase that was commissioned to resist alien attacks before money dried up because there weren't any. It's been pretty much abandoned as a result, so you have the complete lay of the land, a complex maze of similarly looking corridors, elevators and space tech subway tunnels. Elevator called. Please stand by. When that alien attack that never materialised actually does materialise, you have to scramble around the base powering up weapons, turrets and other systems to hold them back. All the while alien bots do everything they can to get in your way. While there will be a fair few blasts coming from your weapon, that isn't the main crux of the game. You have to scramble around looking for software disks and installation pods to get the dense system up and running. Then, once you've done so, you fiddle with the settings from a computer screen to get the best results. You do this under the pressure of attack, as red alien mechs will pour down you if you take too much time. It's an interesting concept that takes the focus away from shooting to finding safe spaces to conduct your work. Then again, the gameplay loop is about constantly getting interrupted while doing busy work. It loses its appeal rather quickly, and the visually unappealing graphics don't help either. The original playstyle DEFCON 5 has will entice a certain type of player, but I found it frustrating and confusing. It's designed as if you need to intimately know the layout of the entire base before playing to get everything done successfully. There is a map, but by being locked to the Voss computer terminals they aren't much help at all. The game design seemed to split reviewers at the time too. Some were expecting an action fest and were left disappointed, while others enjoyed the slow paced thoughtful nature. I'm sure this game has some fans out there, but I found the action to interrupt the tower defence strategy and vice versa, taking away enjoyment from either gameplay style. Add to that the ugly, aged graphics that I'm sure weren't all that at the time, and I find it hard to recommend to anyone other than the most patient of action gamers. You're asking us for help? What's going on? We kind of expected you to help us. Forgive me if I'm wrong, but I thought that was the job of your facility. For a better alien invasion, try SC Out, or Scout. This puzzle action game has you destroying an alien in each of the 101 levels by placing a bomb next to it and shooting it. You control a ship which has no natural defensive or offensive capabilities, save for being able to carry a single object. This can be a key which can be dropped on locks to open up a blockade, or many others. The object you really need to look out for is the spherical bomb, as that is the only weapon that can destroy those invading entities. Getting it there is where the puzzle comes in, and you navigate the map clearing the path forward in order for you to do so. Think Chip's Challenge meets Bomuzel, and you have an idea of what to expect. 
If I do have one issue with the game, it's the difficulty curve. The first two levels teach you about bombs and missiles respectively, but after that it overwhelms you with new mechanics. You'll often be introduced to conveyor belt cogs, bouncing missiles and expanding fungi all in one level. By the time you've understood one thing, you'll have another to wrap your head around. This level of difficulty is acceptable for later levels, but I would have liked these earlier stages to ease players in by having each one of these mechanics be their own thing in a single level. Beyond this, the difficulty does very wildly from level to level. You could breeze through a dozen or more stages before you're bombarded with a smorgasbord of varying interconnected pieces, like a dangerous Rube Goldberg machine. And when you do get stuck like this, the drab and unimaginative visuals start to grate. All 101 levels look exactly the same, despite the odd flourish of new features and tiles. Then again, the graphics are not the draw if you like this type of game, which I very much do. I may have found myself incredibly frustrated when I got stuck on occasion, but after playing 40 odd levels, I was never really bored. In fact, it's one of the better puzzle action games of the era. You can't talk about sci-fi without Star Trek, and Bridge Commander is one of the better games to use the license. I'm sure there isn't a Trekkie out there that hasn't dreamed of being the captain of their own Federation starship, and this game does just that. You are the rookie captain of the USS Dauntless, employed to take the place of the previous captain who perished in an unfortunate star explosion on the Vesuvi system. You may be new, but the Federation will not go easy on you. Over the course of eight chapters and their submissions, you have to investigate this destructive phenomena and the personal and political fallout that came from it. The plot is nothing short of a blockbuster, with intrigue, double crosses and red herrings woven in at multiple points. Even though it's entirely played out from the first person viewpoint of your captain's chair, even though it's entirely played out from your first person viewpoint from the captain's chair, the fact that you still get all of that is a testament to the writing and design. On screen. Moving into attack range. Excellent. You managed to drive them away. They'll think twice before preying on another helpless Cardassian freighter. Because of this, the gameplay is somewhat different than what you might expect. All actions are performed by someone else, you just give the orders. It is a rather passive experience, but it is by no means uninteresting. You have the entire staff at your disposal, including First Officer Captain Safi Larson, who sits to your right. She will offer up reminders about your objectives, and the occasional advice on what to do next, as well as initiating the different alert conditions, which powers up or down different areas of the ship. Lieutenant Commander Brex is your chief engineer, who controls the health and power of these areas. There are four in total, weapons, engines, the sensor array and a shield generator. Having them powered down while in green alert will signal the crew to focus on repairs, while turning them on will allow them to actually be used by the rest of the crew. Elsewhere, your science officer, Lieutenant Commander Miguel Diaz, can launch probes and scan the area of deep space you are currently in. This can provide a wealth of useful information and clues that may impact your future decisions. It is always useful to give each new location a quick scan when you just arrive, just to see what's there. If several ships are present, they'll be noted by the tactical officer, allowing him to differentiate which ship is which. You don't want to target an ally by accident. Talking about your tactical officer, Lieutenant Felix Savali will be the one member of crew you'll call upon the most often. He controls the dogfights, tractor beams and evasive manoeuvres, which make up a good bulk of the game's runtime. You can take aim yourself by selecting manual fire, allowing you to shoot at the target using your mouse as a crosshair, but most of the time it's best left to Felix to do the heavy lifting. You can still select what target to aim at, and the different points on that target, keeping you busy enough anyway. The other officer of note is Ensign Kiska Lamar, who's at the ship's helm. She is responsible for anything to do with navigation and communication. Speak to her to set a new course and warp there, or perhaps enter a planet's orbit to allow communications with the surface. Any messages will be intercepted by her, progressing the story through on-screen conversations. In battle, she can also hail friendly ships with which to give commands, useful if you need help to attack, disable or defend a given target. Considering the nature of the game, it isn't for everybody. The story may be strong, but it's presented in an untraditional fashion and a simple error or misunderstood objective can lead to a game over. 
I'd still highly recommend it regardless, especially to Star Trek fans. It will more than likely satisfy your wish fulfillment, at the very least. Can you scan those freighters and see what they're carrying? They're heavily shielded. If we can boost power... I'm sorry, Captain, they've gone to warp. Sir, yes, sir? multiple Cardassian ships warping in. They're targeting us and the Klingons. Captain, red alert. Your order, sir. We end this month's overview with Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. There are quite a few adaptations of the first Harry Potter movie, and each one was published by Electronic Arts. As licensed games go, they're not that bad, but the one I want to talk about is what I consider to be the best of them all, and this one's exclusive to PCs. This breezy 3D platformer with third-person shooter controls is fairly simple in its design. You attend a lesson where you learn a new spell in a tracing minigame, and then you use those spells in the platforming obstacle course. Nintendo! Eventually you get almost free reign of the corridors at Hogwarts, and the school, with its shocking disregard for health and safety, acts as a hub world of sorts that flow pretty seamlessly into each stage. And within these stages there are a number of collectibles, including chocolate frogs, wizard cards and jelly beans. The ones that are based on a lesson will also contain 5 gold stars, which will determine how many house points you earn, which may affect how the game ends. Later on, all of the spells you've learnt are put to good use in less academic stages, whether they be a perilous trip through the forest to visit Hagrid, or a jaunt through an underground cave system. Each one is used in the same way, hold down the left mouse button, then aim at something you can interact with. A symbol relating to what you can do will appear, letting you know you can release the mouse and something will happen, such as Flipendo to flip things or Wingardium Leviosa to lift things. In between all of the platforming and spell casting, you can jump on a broom and fly around for a bit. At first it's just flying through rings, conjuring flashbacks to Superman 64, but future straddles of the Nimbus 2000 see you knocking Draco Malfoy off his high horse, or chasing snitches in a game of Quidditch. You can even play this convoluted sport directly from the main menu, if you only want a quick match or two. These sections do show off how good looking the game was for 2001. The draw distance is far, textures are detailed, and the art design is bright and enchanting, if you can forgive the sporadic glitch and warped character model, that is. It all moves along at a fast and smooth pace, and none of it overstays its welcome. But as you can imagine from the child-friendly source material, the game is deliberately easy. Considering the younger target audience, this is no shock, but what is surprising is just how entertaining it all is. I will say that a fan-made strafing patch does go some way into helping with this, bringing it closer to more modern control sensibilities, but even back in the day when I first played it, I enjoyed it quite a bit. Whatever your thoughts on the franchise, or its author, Harry Potter is iconic and the Philosopher's Stone more than does it justice. Having fun yet? <gasps> Watch it! Ah! Curse you, Potter! Next time you won't be so lucky. That's it for this month. I hope it all makes up for the unfortunate lack of content this past month. Real life took over, I'm afraid. But if you want to escape all that and find out how to play all these games on Windows 10, head on over to the Collection Chamber website. The link can be found in the description below. The Chamber is more than just this channel, and I've managed to get almost 500 old games working over the years. So if you really like what I'm doing, please consider joining my Patreon, I really do appreciate it. Thank you all for watching, and I hope to see you next time on the Collection Chamber.